Thanks all for coming. And thank you, Caitlin, for volunteering for today's discussion hour. Caitlin is a third year PhD student at UTIC working with Damian Safer. She got her bachelor's from Carleton College and is interested in subduction zones, geomechanics, earthquake hazards, slash processes, and subsurface stress. Let's welcome Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm mostly just going to be showing pictures from my research cruise to Japan. Uh, so please interrupt with questions. Um, so if you guys like have questions on like what I'm showing or like there's something you want to see. Um, also, people online, feel free to chime in um, if you like want to see a picture or something or like have questions. Um, so. Okay. Uh, so this November, I went to Japan for a month. Uh, and though these pictures look like I did a lot of things in Japan, I actually just spent 99% of it on a boat mm -hmm. in the middle of the Pacific. And I was in Japan for a research cruise working with uh, folks from Jams Tech um, to install a sensor on the seafloor um, that can detect uh, earthquake processes. Um, and so I was on this fabulous boat, the Chikyu, which is the Japanese scientific drilling vessel. Um, this uh, drilling vessel has been uh, really instrumental in terms of like earthquake uh, research um, and also just like um, scientific uh, ocean research. Um, and so this is uh, the vessel that is responsible for all of the data that I'm using for my PhD thesis. Uh, and so uh, it was really cool to go out and see, like, I look at all this data online and have no sense of like what the scale is or like how you're actually collecting this data. And so hopefully today I'll be able to give a sense of um, how we actually get uh, drilling data um, and what that process looks like. And so uh, mostly today I'm going to be talking about uh, some science, uh, but more boat life. Uh, <laughs> so that can be what you expect. <laughs> um, okay, so all of this research wouldn't be possible without the science party um, and also a lot of the support system that you have uh, aboard the Chikyu. Um, and so these are the quote unquote mug shots uh, <laughs> from the science party. Um, and so Araki san was the chief scientist. Uh, he's up here. Um, and then we had a whole host of us that were kind of like responsible for dis different aspects of the observatory installation. And so there were multiple types of sensors and then information that was collected uh, during drilling. And so each person kind of had like their own role to play with like getting things set up and installed on the seafloor. Um, we also had a PR team, uh, which was Murata san from Jams Tech, and then also Maida san and Akutsu san uh, were the EPMs. And so they basically are like in charge of the world when you're out on a boat. Like they do everything in terms of like scheduling, communicating between the scientists who are kind of like uh, bottom of the totem pole in terms of like knowing what's going on. Like everyone who works on Chikyu is super knowledgeable. And so they're kind of like the middle people like can uh, communicating information and making sure that like we're doing the right things, we're like in the right places and that everybody like is able to like perform the science and research safely. Um, in addition, there was a, a huge support from Mare lab staff. Um, so there's labs for the Chikyu that they supported us. Um, and then an engineering team that also helped with um, all the aspects of the installation. And so the reason we're out there is because uh, lots of earthquakes happen in Japan, uh, which is probably no news to any of you guys here. Um, but Japan has two major subduction zones. So we have the Japan Trench up here in the north. Uh, people may be familiar with the magnitude 9 2011 Tohoku earthquake that was followed by a large tsunami um, and was covered a lot in the news. And then the Nantai Trough down here, um, which has hosted historically large magnitude 8 and greater um, microcross events, but also um, has like hosted tremor and slope slip events. Um, and so it's extremely tectonically active and there's been a lot of research in this area. And so today I'm gonna be talking about work done down in this area. And so a little bit of terminology, I'm gonna put up SSE, which is a slow slip event. And it's basically just like a slow earthquake that instead of happening instantaneously, it happens over days to weeks. And then L LTBMS, which is long-term borehole monitoring system, which basically is just a uh, like short name for all the sensors that we're about to install on the seafloor. Um, and so 
Japan has an extremely extensive uh, sensing network, um, and it's probably like top of mind when people think of like earthquake subduction zone research, just in the amount of resources um, and scientific um, like uh, like work that's been done and contributed to the region. And so um, they have uh, a system called Donut, which basically live streams data um, to the mainland of Japan. And so it's this cabled network that you can see uh, in black here um, that also has nodes extending off of each part of the cable. And these nodes are where a bunch of sensors are also installed um, on the seafloor. So that includes um, like geodetic sensors, uh, pressure sensors, um, and all of this is directly then transmitted um, to the mainland. And it's part of like uh, their um, like hazard uh, mapping um, and analysis, um, but it also provides information about like possible tsunami hazard and everything else happening in the region. And so, these three triangles here are existing borehole observatories. And so what this means is just sensors that are installed into the seafloor. And uh, this is kind of like the first time uh, that they use these observatories to detect uh, slow slip events. Um, and then it kind of like paved the way to have this installed in other subduction zones globally, um, including for example, like New Zealand. And so the plan is to install these three new observatories in red um, over the next uh, like coming years. And so this research project was installing this first observatory. And so uh, looking at those green observatories that I showed you that were installed before, um, this was a part of like a two decade long project called Nantrosize, um, where they went out and drilled a huge cross section of boreholes throughout the Nankai Trop. Um, and here is an example from uh, work conducted by Iraqi-san and others, where they use sensors at C2 and C10 to uh, detect pore pressure, and they were able to de detect slow slip events um, that were regularly occurring um, over a multi-year period. And so here, again, we have these boreholes C2 in blue and C10 here, and with changes in pressure, they were able to detect each one of these events um, and quantify like the magnitude of strain and also the amount of slip that's occurred in the region. Um, and so the idea is that with this being so successful, um, being able to extend, extend the observatory installations, they'll be able to detect more slow slip events and like the magnitude of uh, seismic activity that you have throughout the whole region. And so today I'll be talking about all of the work that went into installing this observatory here in red. and. In the next few years, they're going to be putting out calls potentially to have scientists participate in this observatory and this observatory installation. So if you see this or if you have friends that are like, wow, that's super cool, uh, there are always opportunities to get on these research expeditions. And they're really excited to collaborate and work with um, international colleagues. And so in the region where we have this installation, uh, which is here, uh, they've detected possible slow slip events and also uh, very low frequency earthquakes and tremor in the region. And so there's a pretty uh, good idea that this area is pretty tectonically active. And so having this observatory will um, really expand our understanding of like the magnitude of types of events that are happening in the region. Um, and it was also the first time of installing a uh, brand new um, downhole technology. And so this is just a seismic cross section to give you a sense of where the observatory is installed. It was in this basin area um, and the borehole is 500 meters deep. And so just to give you a sense for what the Chikyu is like, it's absolutely gigantic. Uh, I had no idea until I like walked up to it and was like, oh my goodness, like you're like looking up and like you can barely see the top of it when you like get to uh, port. And so, uh, this is just a view of the derrick, and then a view of me standing in front of uh, the derrick as well. And so this is from the top, looking down on Chikyu. On the last few days, we got to go up uh, and get kind of like a planned view. It was amazing. Um, so on the uh, front, we have the heli deck here. Uh, generally, there were like helicopters that would come like every few days to do like crew exchanges. Um, and so you would always get updates where they'd be like, no one go out on the heli deck. And then you could see the helicopter coming in, which was really fun. Um, but a lot of people use the area to like go for walks during the day and get some fresh air. 
Uh, this section of the boat here is the labs and living spaces. So there were three floors that are de uh, dedicated to scientific laboratories. And then below that is living spaces, which include like um, the kitchen, a gym, like basically most of many, there's like a movie room, ping pong, like most amenities that you like might want to see are available to you. Um, and then there's a bunch of like heavy machinery and equipment. Here's, uh, you can see two of the cranes. There's also two on the back of the boat. Um, and then behind here is the rig floor and the derrick. And so in the living area, this is what my room looked like. Uh, so generally, uh, there are two bunks and you alternate shifts um, with someone. For this cruise, I was uh, the only female scientist, so I actually got my own room, which I felt was really fortunate and extremely <laughs> luxurious for a month at sea. Um, but generally, it's like if I'm working the night shift from uh, midnight to noon, then the person that I'd be sharing the bunk with would be alternating, and so we'd be working different shifts. Um, but yeah, so this is my bunk. There's like a little desk and then the chair generally had to be like bungee corded to the desk so that things don't roll around. Everything is like super lock and key so that things aren't like crashing all night. Uh, this is what it looks like. So there's like a little shower, a bathroom, um, which is basically like toilet sink, um, a mirror that you like couldn't see too much out of. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of plotted over. Um, and then uh, in the hallway, this is like a view of each one of the rooms and there's laundry services performed every day. So you basically just like hang your stuff up on your door and within six hours, they just return it to you like washed and dried. Uh, it is so convenient. And I was like, yeah, it was very nice. And your room is also like clean. So they have this huge staff that does a ton of like cleaning and everything. They change out like your towels and everything every day. And so there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to like support everyone that's conducting the scientific operations. Um, I definitely brought too many clothes. Uh, so lesson learned, you basically could like exist on like two outfits if you really needed to. Um, there's a ton of lab space on the Chiku, um, so they're set up for a lot of, to be able to do a lot of analysis while you're at sea. So as soon as the samples come up, you're able to do analysis right away. And then there's also a bunch of technical staff to support that. Um, and then here is a view of the derrick on the right. And then uh, on the left is basically a picture like right here at the bottom of the derrick. And just to give you a sense of scale, uh, each one of these uh, giant pipes is 20 meters high. And so like a person for reference, in my mind, when I look at like logs and it's like, oh, a few meters, it doesn't seem that big. But then when you're out here and you see something that's like actually 20 meters, you're like, wow, that's really deep. And so then it, when it, you're drilling down to 500 meters depth, um, you just like imagine stacking each one of these casings over and over again to get there. Um, and it's crazy, like the extent of operations. And so, uh, this is just to give a sense of like what it looks like relative to like a reference of a human being size. Um, and so this is a video of them like unscrewing two pieces of casing. Um, so they're screwed together and then they use these mechanical arms uh, to basically disconnect the pipes. And so you'll see like water. Yeah, so there is where it's like disconnected. And so there are like drillers that are in here um, and they are the ones that like control all operations on the drill floor and then they're supported by a group of like drilling staff and so they operate these like giant mechanical arms um, and then are also in charge of like safety and everything that's happening um, and it's pretty cool to see like how precise they're able to be with like these huge pieces of machinery but then still able to get all this uh, work done. And so below the drilling deck is the moon pool. Uh, so this is how you're able to go from the drill floor and connect pipe that goes all the way down to the sea floor. So basically imagine like a giant hole in the middle of the ship. Uh, it's generally not an area that you work, uh, but for this cruise, we are actually on the moon pool pretty frequently uh, to do the assembly. And so it's an extremely dangerous part of the boat. Uh, this is a video that shows the water moving uh, while we were um, doing operations. And so everyone that's on the moon pool has to be harnessed um, in at all times because it's extremely dangerous if you were to like fall um, and be trapped in that water. Um, and so a lot of the operations were like extremely safety focused. So we're wearing full PPE, hard hats, and then also are harnessed in so that there's no risk of falling into the moon pool. Yeah. Where is the harness connecting to? 
so in this like giant room so we're like right here working on this deck and then up here like way above are all these like connection points and so there were four tie-offs on like this side mm -hmm. so you can see one of the cables right here mm -hmm. and it connects like basically up to these like ceiling points um and so there were four on either side so eight people at a time could be harnessed and like working on the moon pool and so there's a lot of like you'd go out and work for like an hour or two and then if you had to like switch off you'd switch with the person and so someone would like help by grabbing your harness connector and then switching you out okay in addition to this there's also uh an rov on board the chick you and this is to like check to make sure like are we drilling in the right spot is like the drill bit going back in the hole that we like already made um checking equipment doing also like physical checks and so this is like a super important aspect um because otherwise it's kind of hard to just like go in blind especially with ocean drilling and so there's basically a shipping container uh that is like the rov control room and so they have a bunch of these screens and they're able to control the rov and generally you have a pilot and a co-pilot uh, that are doing all the work related to the rov stuff so uh, right here is the pilot and he has like a little like joystick situation and then on the right is his co-pilot that's like giving information about like the positioning and everything of the rov <laughs> and so every day on Chiki, or not every day, once a week you have uh safety drills and so uh there's always this really really loud alarm that goes off and then they give you uh prep like preparation instructions so this could be muster at a point like where your safety boat is uh or going like they'll give like imaginary scenarios of like a fire is here and so then you have to like go to a specific interior area and like check in with like your group um and so this is an example of what one of the lifeboats look like and they do a really good job of like giving me preparation of like this is what you would expect this is like what's on the lifeboat um so it's definitely helpful i think the first one i was like so nervous and i didn't understand how to tie the life jacket onto myself very well and by the end i was like resident expert like ready to go um whenever the drills went off but I think the one of my favorite parts and the most important part about being on these cruises is getting to be outside and enjoy the sunrise and sunset. Uh, so I made a point of going out every single day that I could um, to get a view of the sunset. Um, it's pretty cool, like when there's nothing on the horizon except for water um, and the clouds are always so pretty and like it's just nice to be able to go outside. <laughs> Anyway, so going back to what the science was <laughs> that we were doing, <laughs> um, we were installing this uh, borehole monitoring system, and it had three primary components. And so this is the schematic of what it looks like. And there were three main sensors that were being installed. First was a fiber optic strain meter that basically measures strain in the formation or seafloor. Um, that's going to be this like black, uh, what looks like a black box. Um, and then the next was fiber optical sensing, um, which included DAS and also TWCOTDR. And this was the first time that they had done downhole installation um, of this technology. So it was cool to see it being tested um, and figuring out like what worked, what didn't. And then the final part is this pore fluid pressure sensing. And so at the bottom of the borehole here, you have two ports, um, which basically are able to measure fluid pressure. And then there's lines that connect all the way up to the top here and you have a pressure gauge that measures um, the changes in pressure and then everything is connected to a donut interface which basically allows you to stream all of the data um, in real time to land uh, which I think is like mind-blowing to realize that like we can install instruments like thousands of meters uh like below and still get data like almost immediately and so this is super advanced technology um and it's really cool to see that um like the japanese government is super invested um in increasing the installation of these instruments and so looking at like what do these pieces look like so this is the fiber optic strain meter um so this entire sensor package um is pretty large you can see uh yoko biki san standing here um, and it's definitely like two or three times his size. Um, and so this 
entire sensor is going to be installed down at the bottom of the borehole. And then there's cabling that connects all the way to the top. And at the top, we have this donut interface. And so this is like what allows them to like plug and play sensors into the donut network. And so each of these caps is where they're able to like plug in and connect a new sensor. And so right now they just have like dummy caps. Um, but like right here is what they use to connect to the existing cable network. And then each one of these will have like a pressure sensor, the strain meter like plugged in and connected. And so this is how they're able to transmit the data. And so for this uh, fiber optic strain meter, um, it's fiber optic cable that runs the entire length of the observatory. And at the bottom is helically wound here. Um, so you can see it uh, in real life on the right. Um, and it's 200 meters worth of fiber optic cable. And this is, ends up basically like touching uh, the rock in the seafloor and is able to measure strain. Um, and it also has a reference cable and a sensing cable so that it can detect strain and also temperature changes. Um, and then on the left, on the left, is it standing like on end before they lowered it down to be like fully connected on the moon pool? Uh, but it's just cool to see like how big this thing is because most of us are used to seeing pictures like this. And it's hard to get a sense of like what that actually means in terms of like sensing. Uh, the next part is um, the fiber optic sensing. And so this was in the form of DAS and TWC or PDR. Um, and this is the first time that this technology has been tested down a borehole. Um, one of the operational challenges we ran into is that our like um, sensing unit was on the boat. And in order to actually like connect, we had to have fiber optic cable that went all the way from the boat down to the bottom of the borehole. And so you lost, um, you weren't able to detect much by the time you got down to here, uh, just due to like the length of cable and the frequency that you're able to detect. Um, but they still were able to like during testing, um, they were able to detect basically like the tides on like the sections of cable that were being lowered down, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, and then there's also like some electrical noise from the connection between the ROV um, and the sensors. And so that kind of impacted too, like the data that we were able to, co to collect while we were testing. And then the final um, is this pore pressure sensing. Again, we have these ports down here that connects all the way up to a sensing unit at the top. And then this is data that's streamed uh, to the mainland. And so on the bottom, this is what the pressure ports look like. It's called mini screens. I was always confused reading like what is a mini screen? Um, and it's actually these long tubes that are like, uh, have these little fine um, like slits in them. So it keeps the sediment from getting in, but then you're still able to measure pressure. And so these are basically strapped to the casing at the bottom of the borehole and then connected to metal lines. Um, so here you can see it's strapped uh, to the casing. So this is like lowered all the way down into the bottom of the hole, 500 meters below the seafloor. And then there are these tiny metal lines that come all the way up and connect right here. Um, this is like the top of the cork head. So this is going to be sticking out on top of the seafloor. And then uh, there's this like pressure sensing unit. So this is what records the changes of pressure. And then uh, this is plugged in here to that like donut like interface. Um, so you can see that there's like a lot of moving parts, even for just one of these sensors, a lot of things have to be tested and connected um, and prepared like in advance. And so I did uh, most of like my job was to like help getting this set up and ready to go to the seafloor. Um, and so every day you start by going and looking at this whiteboard uh, and it basically organizes your entire life. So it's tell you exactly what to do and where to go. Um, and so most of it gives information about like, what time are we all meeting? When are we like covering important information? Like what do we need to achieve for that day in order for operations to go smoothly? smoothly. Um, every day we met in this like conference room and we did like a daily meeting update, but also um, science talks. And so all the scientists generally give like 20 to 30 minute talks about like what they do for research. So it's really cool to be able to like, collaborate with them on the installation, but also learn like what they're interested in, like what they've done in the past. Um, and it ended up being like super fruitful, like scientific discussions, um, which is always really cool. And so for our operations, 
the first part was to uh, drill the top section of the borehole and install casing to basically like keep the hole open and then drill all the way down to 500 meters. Once we drilled that entire length, we would lower the sensor all the way down. It gets cemented into the hole so that you have contact between the sediment and the strain meter. Um, and then we like lift off and go away and it's all a success. Now, so first part is drilling this hole. Uh, so here you can see the casing that's being suspended in the derrick and it's being lowered down into the moon pool and all the way down to the sea floor. And so I don't remember the exact water depth, but I think it was like uh, at least 2000 meters. Uh, so they have to connect pipe to get it lowered all the way down. So it takes like hours of them like connecting like section by section until they're able to reach the sea floor. And so we drilled this hole and we went with the ROV to go check on it. Uh, but it turns out the casing was supposed to be sticking out of the hole, but it just got like sucked in to the sea floor. Uh, so trial number one was not <laughs> the most successful and you have to have the casing sticking out because that's what's connecting the cork head to the entire sensor package. And so with that, we had to move a few meter, a hundred meters away. And they also had to be aware of, there's like this cable network all over the seafloor, right? So you don't want to like drill into this cable network and disconnect it. So there was like a lot of operations to make sure that we knew exactly where we were before we drilled our next hole. And so during this time, we got to continue prepping sensors and also enjoy uh, food and housing on <laughs> Chicken. Um, and so four meals are served per day. Yeah. So did they just lose all of the sensors in that one casing that went down? Or is, so we haven't installed the sensors yet. Basically, like we drilled a hole and then we like shoved the casing in and then we drilled all the way down to completion. And as we were basically like cleaning and sputting the hole, we think that it basically like provided enough like ground motion that like liquefaction esque style just like sinking into the subsurface. Um, and I'll also explain we did like some further investigation at the end, uh, but there's probably multiple reasons why it didn't work the first time. And so the second time what the plan was was originally it was only 20 meters of casing and they were like, well, we're going to do 100 meters of casing because it basically provides like a much more like a better stick to the formation um, and it's able to get like more of a hold. So, yeah. So did it just like sink to the bottom? It probably went like a few, like a few meters, meters down, but it was like, you can't, can't get it back. Yeah. And the second hole we did, it was like the rest of the 20 inch casing we had on board. And so it was like, if that one didn't go, it was like, we just don't have casing anymore. <laughs> so that's part of like a lot of part about like ocean science research is like something happens, like not every expedition is flawless. And then it's like, you have to figure out like, what is the best way that we can like still achieve our science goals. Mm -hmm despite the fact that like things maybe are not going our way, like sensors break, like things get lost, like stuff happens. Um, but yeah, so while this is happening, we got to uh, go and have uh, fabulous food. So every day they provide a menu, which is what's on the left here. And they have like special days like ramen day or like they would make like uh, made by request like udon bowls that were like super fancy or like sushi. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'm gluten intolerant and so I'm super picky about food because uh, sometimes it can just be hard to eat when everything is uh, coated in uh, fried batter. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were super accommodating and did a really good job of like labeling things so that I could eat and there's always options for me, uh, which was really nice. And so it's basically like this huge buffet setup. They always have like a salad bar, rice, um, and other food. And then there's cereal and ice cream and like breads and spreads and stuff. Um, and then very importantly, there's two espresso machines. Uh, so I had a lot of espresso as a part of this. Um, but yeah, so there's all these tables and everybody like sits together and eats and chats. And so this is a picture of some of the scientists uh, enjoying dinner one evening. Um, and so as you can see, there's just like a lot of options. So a lot of people at times people have like a bunch of like small things that they were like trying. Um, and then they do like seasonal stuff. I tried persimmons for the first time and they were amazing and I got really into them. I never had like a sweet one, 
they were I feel like they were always bitter when I was growing up. So we had like, yeah, they were very good. Um, but yeah, so this is what dining is like. And so now we're back at installation and we have drilled our new hole. Uh, and you can see this is the label 99 for our 100 meter casing. And so this is 20 inches in diameter. And so you could basically like fit an entire human being inside of it. Uh, and it's like super tall too. So it was cool to see like how this entire thing got like put together and delivered to the seafloor. And so a lot of uh, this like research crews is also just like watching and learning. Um, so we are constantly like talking with each other and like watching operations happening and like the EPM would call and be like, oh, they're doing this. And like we would all come out to see because it's pretty cool seeing like things being moved around on the ship and like how everything happens. And so we uh, began assembling all these sensors once we knew that we had a hole that we were able to work with. Um, and this is like the sensor package of the strain meter that I showed you earlier that's being like lifted all the way and then raised vertically to go down for installation. Um, so a lot of it like seems pretty simple, but there's so many moving parts and like everything ends up being kind of nervous. You're like, okay, this sensor package is something we really need and we need to move it from A to B. And it's like, they are so good about like being super delicate with these super sensitive sensors but also using this huge machinery, which was like pretty cool to see. And so I did a lot of prepping of this uh, pressure sensor. And so we made sure that there are no air in the lines um, and did like multiple pressure checks to make sure like we tested every sensor multiple times before it reached the seafloor. So multiple times on deck and then as we were installing and then even as we were lo lowering it through the water, we were checking to make sure that things were working okay. Otherwise we'd pull up before we got to the seafloor um, and fix things. And so this is the cork head and it has now been lifted and is being lowered down through the drill floor. Uh, down to the moon pool where everything's connected. And so once this stuff started to happen, it was like 24 hour operations where there are people always working at every hour of the day and making sure that things were getting connected because uh, this entire section that goes into the seafloor is 500 meters long. And so everything has to be connected on and you have like tubing and also fiber optic cable that needs to be like tied onto the casing. And so this, uh, piece here, the cork head gets lowered down and is eventually connected to this base. And so this entire thing is what sits above the seafloor um, and transmits the data um, to land. And so uh, this is like a bird's eye view of the moon pool area. And so up here is like where everyone's working um, to get things connected. And again, you're like harnessed in at all times. And so it took like a lot of work to be able to coordinate like Oh, watch, you're crossing the line with someone else, or like, I need this tool handed up here. Um, so there's a lot of prep work to be able to like install everything. And so uh, this is the um, cork head in its final form. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of cables and lines that are all brought up and connected here. Uh, and so it took a lot of checking, um, like double, triple checking to make sure that everything was connected properly. And then we did multiple tests of all the sensors to make sure that it was working. And so finally, we were done after many hours of operating and people were really excited because this is like a huge undertaking to get all of this set up. Um, here is Chi Science Araki-san uh, and then uh, Machida-san who did a lot of the um, like sensor planning um, and connection. He is like extremely talented uh, and was able to um, like do a really good job of like telling people like, oh, can you help me with this? Or like uh, giving people a dedicated tasks to work on where we're all able to then come together and um, finish the completion. And so this is the engineering science party all eagerly waiting to watch the cork head be like lowered uh, down through the moon pool. Um, and here are a few pictures of it like slowly being lowered. Um, it was definitely like super exciting to be like, wow, like all of this work, this is like multiple weeks of work to like see it all come to final form. Um, and so as this is happening, we were able to get ROV updates. So the ROV watched the entire time as everything was lowered down the water column. And you can kind of see here, this is like the drill string going back into, or like the sensor string going back into the casing at the seafloor. Um, and it's crazy being on this giant boat 
And so if you imagine like standing up and there's a straw that's taped to the floor and you have like a single string and are trying to get that string to go into the straw, but you can't get any closer. And your arm is also like whipping around. <laughs> like that is what ocean drilling is like. So it's pretty impressive to see them be able to like essentially put a piece of spaghetti <laughs> into a straw <laughs> and like not be able to see it at all. Um, and so it's cool to like having the ROV and being able to see what it looks like and how they're able to like navigate the ship to be able to make all this work. Uh, this is a photo of Machida-san and I. We did pictures after we did the installation and everyone was just excited to be outside and in the sunshine. Um, so this is the uh, cork head being finally connected down at the seafloor. Um, and so once this happened, then we all got together and started doing a bunch of testing. Uh, this was my least favorite part of the cruise because it was basically standing in a shipping container for like 12 hours straight waiting for the ROV to be able to connect things and then do your testing. Um, and so this is what it looks like through the eye of the ROV, right? So we go up and what we need to do is connect a cable that's attached to the ROV and plug it into each one of these ports and then conduct tests. And so it's a matter of lift off the cap, attach the cap to your ROV arm, find the cable, attach the cable, run the test, detach, grab the cap, put the cap on. And so it's really technical um, and it was cool to watch them like perform all of these tasks. And so this is a picture of the ROV arm turning um, one of the, um, uh, there are like multiple valves for the pressure sensor. And so you can see like the size of the valve relative to the ROV arm. And they're doing this like in open water where there's like a water current and everything else. It's pretty crazy to watch them be able to like do super like fine motor skill tasks like this. Um, and so here is a summary of some of the data that we got from the strain meter. And so this is from each test that we did. And so this top panel is showing sensor depth and then the day that we tested. And so the idea is that uh, we start first on the ship and then we test in the moon pool where the sensors are in the water, but they're not very far down. And then as we lower and get into the hole, we test each time. And so first when we're on the ship, it's super noisy. Uh, and it continues to be noisy as uh, we're in the moon pool, right? Because you have tides uh, that are creating noise and the sensor is sensing the tide. Then uh, we continue to lower down. This is when we're still um, like in the water column, but we're like almost to the seafloor. And you can see that there's still quite a bit of noise from the sensor. But as soon as we lower the sensor down into the hole, the noise is like completely reduced, which is pretty cool to see. And so this was our first test before cementing uh, into the hole. And so it still um, is detecting like some strain because it hasn't been fully cemented. And so it can still feel um, the effect of like tides. Uh, but then the final one is where we fully cemented into the hole and you can see that it becomes extremely quiet, uh, which means that we were successfully able to like cement and couple the sensor to the formation. Um, so this is cool just to kind of get a sense of like each way, like how we tested and like what we were looking for to confirm that like installation went successfully. Um, same thing. So this is pressure data. And so on the left is temperature and that's for these like red and orange dots. And then on the right on the Y axis is pressure. And so if you look first at the pressure data in blue, at first we're just like atmospheric pressure because that's all we're detecting is just the atmosphere. And then as we lower the pressure is increasing because we're going further down into the ocean and the pressure is increasing. Um, and then these final two tests are when uh, we then cement off. And so the bottom of the hole should be detecting a different pressure than what you detect at the seafloor. Um, and then same thing from temperature, it gets colder as you go down uh, with the sensor. And so this is showing uh, pressure data from before cementing and after cementing. And so the pressure sensor is like protected from the cement underneath. So it's only measuring fluid pressure. And so at first, before we cement, all of the sensors are measuring pressure at the seafloor. But once we cement it, we're isolating two of those sensors to be measuring the pressure in the formation or in the rocks. 
And then this blue line stays the same because it's just a separate pressure port that's actually measuring C4 pressure. Um, so this is a good sign that we've like isolated the sensors down the hole to only detect changes in formation pressure. So changes in like fluid in the rock. And then the one on the top is just check that um, is measuring like the C4 pressure. Um, during this, there also is just like constant discussion about like findings. And so every day we were like pulling up plots about what we found and like having conversations about data. Um, and so it's a really cool opportunity to basically be like human summer camp, but it's like science. Um, and I feel like I one like learned so much from all these people that are like experts in their field, um, but also got like a lot of really important feedback for my research, um, which was really cool. And so this is like the, this is just like an odd side uh, piece, but so they use this stuff called protect zone, which basically like protects the pressure ports from the cement so that they don't fill with cement. And what it is, is it's like this gel that is a, able to keep the cement above, but then like a month from now, it'll like dissolve into basically like water. So it's like this super engineered like gel stuff that then turns into water. Um, and then this is like a video of like what it looks like. So they inject this into the bottom of the hole before they fill the rest up with cement. And so the bottom is like protected, but then it's eventually just going to like turn into the equivalent of like water, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so we've now drilled and cased our hole, installed our sensor, and then the last step uh, we've cemented and now we need to release and then uh, pull out of hole, which they abbreviated as poo, uh, <laughs> which I found extremely amusing. <laughs> um, scientific drilling loves uh, acronyms and abbreviations for things, uh, and often there are like multiple acronyms for the same thing. <laughs> so this is an image of the ROV hand that's like grabbing each one of these, and it has to grab and disconnect each one before it can like release the tool, and then the ship is basically disconnected from the sensor package. Um, and so this, um, it was like pretty cool to watch. So on the right, this is like the right hand of the ROV, so it like grabs on to stabilize itself, and then it uses its left arm to like do all of the operations. Um, and then this is an image of it like pulling away. And so you can see this is like remnants of the cement that's been pumped into the hole that's like kind of like dissipating out. Um, and so we were able to watch all of this from the work area. And so each one of us has like a little like cubicle desk situation. And so you have like a desk and a work uh, station. Um, and there's like a lot access to a library and you can like see constantly operations that are going on. And so they have like cameras, they have like over a hundred cameras on Chick U. So you can like change channels. It's like being on like cable TV, but like the TVs are just like watching parts of the boat. And so you can like switch to like, this is the ROV channel um, and watch, which is pretty cool. And on the last day, there was this rainbow, uh, which felt uh, very fortuitous and uh, a good sign that our entire operation went well. But, uh, oh, this is, so I would always invite people out to go watch sunrise and sunset. And this was at the end as we were headed towards land, but you can see that many of the scientists were more interested in their uh, Japanese cell coverage. <laughs> about like there's this like beautiful sunrise in the background and they were like competing for who could get like a map of how far we are from shore because at this point we couldn't see shore but we were getting like spotty cell service um this was also at the time where there was a like u.s plane that went down in japan and we were like getting alerts about it on the boat with like the spotty service which was pretty interesting uh, but if you remember, uh, the mud monster paid us a visit. Uh, there's still more work to be done to confirm whether this guy exists. Uh, but one of the big questions was like, why did we lose this casing? And is this going to be a problem for like the other locations where we go do this in the future, right? So in two years or so, when they do the next installation, they want to be prepared to know like, what do we need operationally to get this done? And so this... We had a few um, extra days, and so what they did was a coring operation where we recovered samples from the seafloor of like the upper hundred meters um, to figure out like what are the material properties and like why did this happen. And so 
the way that the pouring works is it's super quick operations. Uh, they're very talented, especially like the upper hundred meters is so soft that it happens super quickly. So basically within like less than a day, we had recovered hundred meters of core, which is pretty impressive. And so uh, over the loudspeakers, they yell, core on deck. And everyone like scrambles to get like full PPE on. So by the end of this trip, I was like very fast. Like I could get into like my coveralls, hard hat and everything else within like minutes. And so then you go up uh, into this area where you're waiting. And so the core comes from the derrick up here and is brought along this conveyor belt. It gets to this uh, core cutting area. And the first thing you do is record a bunch of information about it on the whiteboard. And so like length, uh, how much did you recover? And then each uh, then it's sectioned off into pieces. And so we do this core splitting where it's sectioned off and you basically like cut it and then cover it with these caps here. Uh, but we ran into a bit of issue uh, with gas. Uh, and so pouring took a little longer because we had to degas uh, each section of the core, which was unexpected, uh, at least like we weren't expecting to run into this much gas. And so uh, what they do is they drill tiny little holes into each section of the core and let it degas for like 30 minutes before you split it, because otherwise when you split it, it like expands and like chunks of core just like go shooting out the end. Um, and so this is a video of the hole. And so you can see like, because it's opened up this pathway, sediment is able to actually like escape out the hole, but it shoots out in these like little like worm things. <laughs> um, and so once we have each section, it's brought into the labs and they have like a bunch of different um, like things that they can do to the core. And so I found it incredible. They have like an entire MRI machine on board. <laughs> Uh, and there's just like this, uh, one of the lab techs is doing an MRI scan of every single section of core. Um, and so basically like the core comes on, they like measure it, they take photos of it, they like do all of these like measurements and scans, um, and then it's given to the scientists to be able to process. So there's like a lot of work, the lab technicians are like extremely busy. Um, they actually like flew out additional techs to come help with coring operations because it's like, so much work goes into it. And so once they've done all these initial uh, scans, uh, I was patiently waiting and we got incredible views of Mount Fuji at the end. So I spent a lot of time outside uh, during this, um, but the core is split into two halves. You have a working half and an archive half. And so the archive half is like basically like can be used um, in the future, but it goes to Kochi Core uh, Center um, and it's stored and then people can like request parts of it if there's like future work, like in a few years, maybe we have new technology and we can like then request samples. Um, but then the working half uh, is tested for material properties. So this is an example of one of the working halves. And so you can see that samples have been taken from it for testing. Um, and then this is just examples of some of like the tests that we do for like material properties. And then the archive half uh, is taken like super detailed photos and then described in detail by the scientists. So that's like uh, composition, color, like anything else like structurally that's going on in the core. Um, and there are like so many like lab aspects too. Like we have like a full set of like microscopes and like any tool that you basically could want and also support from techs. Um, and so a lot of it too is like discussions of like, where should we sample? Like what might be interesting to like do testing on in the future? And so there's a lot of like collaborative discussion. Um, I also learned a lot of new sampling techniques and skills. Sometimes I looked extremely serious, uh, but mostly I had fun. <laughs> um, and at the end of the uh, cruise, half the scientists left. And so there were only like a few of us on board and they were like, we are doing a safety meeting today and we have it scheduled out for an hour and a half. And this was like pretty normal, like once a month, they'll like discuss safety meeting with the crew and like we would go to safety meetings, but I was like, we're done, like we're in port. <laughs> like, I don't understand what we're gonna be discussing for an hour. Uh, and so I sat down and this was what they showed at the safety meeting. Yeah. This is also the most Japanese like video ever. It's very charming. <laughs> I don't think.
Oh, it's not playing the sound. I'm in. Uh, but it's like playing this like full sound. <laughs> um, and then they choreographed this. This was like all of the group that had like already left. Uh, and so it was like this full choreographed thing. It was like extremely sweet. <laughs> Uh, but it turns out that uh, if you're trying to plan a surprise birthday party, it works out really well if everyone speaks a language that the one person is like, because <laughs> <laughs> they all knew that it was not a safety meeting, and I was like prepped for the safety meeting. I, I didn't even know that they knew it was my birthday. Like I didn't tell anyone, so I was extremely surprised. Uh, and generally, they make a giant, like a elaborate cake uh, for people's birthday, but they did this like full like fruit platter. Uh, where everything was like cut into like super specific like shapes and stuff. It was extremely nice. Uh, so we all got to hang out and enjoy this extremely elaborate fruit platter for my birthday, which was really nice. Um, this is a photo of the scientific um, or like the science team and also um, the engineering team. And so all of these people played a super important role in being able to install all of these sensors um, and complete these operations. And so I think it's pretty cool seeing like all the work that goes into data that a lot of people will be using for like years to come, especially uh, these sensors because of the way that the data is like streamed to the mainland. It's going to be like integral for scientific research for like at least a decade or more. Uh, and it's pretty cool that all of these people are able to like come together and like contribute to that science. Um, and for me, I'm super thankful too for like all of the people that have gone on previous research cruises to be able to collect the data that I use every day for my research. And so it was a really awesome opportunity for me to be able to like go uh, and also like contribute uh, to this aspect of the science. Um, and then, so Murata san uh, was here, was a PR person that was on board and did like a full um, like filming of all the events. And so this is a short two minute movie of operations and kind of just gives like a summary of stuff that I've talked about. <laughs> Sped up so funny. I don't know. <laughs> There's one that's like a five minute long video of it, like slowly <laughs> being said. <laughs> yeah, so this is inside the ROV container where we stood for many hours. <laughs> and then connecting the caps. Uh, but yeah, so I think another thing too that's really cool is just like the amount of work uh, that's been contributed by like Jamstack and Mare to um, like install these sensors, but it also takes like years of planning. So they've been doing like testing on the sensors and like making sure like everything is like engineered exactly to be able to do this. Um, so it's like a huge operation um, and it was really cool that I was able to be a part of it. And I'm actually going back to Japan this fall uh, for an IODP cruise, and I'm going to be on the boat for two months. Uh, and we're going to be going to the Japan Trench, which is like the northern subduction zone, and to the area um, of 
the Tohoku rupture. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be interested in doing like analysis of like what is stress in the press, which is more like what my normal research is. Um, so it'll be pretty cool to go back uh, this fall. And then have you answered any questions? And also students at UTIG, if you have any feedback uh, for directions for UTIG or like student feedback, I'm going to like the UTIG retreat and it would be good to get feedback. And I figured this would be an easy way to tell you <laughs> that I'm, solic I'm soliciting responses. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. This is so cool. Are onions? Yes, those are onions. Yeah. There are like a bunch of really cute things of like, you'll realize like people are like out on the cube all the time and like have their like own full like setups. It's like very impressive. So I feel like there should be like a shared document of like comfort items that people <laughs> bring to like give you a sense. Cause that was like one thing I was like, I was so nervous because I was like, I don't know what I need for a month. Like, how many books do you pack? Like, do you guys have no one around here you can ask about? <laughs> well, everyone's like, no one like says anything about it. That's the thing. There are people, but then it's like everyone has their own take. Like, it'd be fun to like read a document is more so. But yeah, I encourage everyone to go on like some sort of like, if they're interested in a research cruise, it's just like really cool. Even if it's for like a week, it's like, really fun to be at sea uh, and like get hands-on experience of like how this data is collected. So. Well, thanks, yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody online for coming. <laughs> if anyone has any questions online too, you're more than welcome to unmute or in the room. What comfort item would it be? would you bring for September for two months? Mm -hmm. Definitely different snacks. Uh, I'm going to be bringing a lot more microwave popcorn. Mm -hmm. It's like apparently not a thing in Japan. And I brought a few bags and we like did like a ROV, like watching, I I picture it as like the worst, slowest movie you've ever watched. <laughs> it's, like, it's like silent and like things are kind of going wrong, but like also end up, end up working. But it was like an hour long viewing of just watching the ROV try to like get things to work. And we had popcorn and everybody was super excited about microwave popcorn. So I'm definitely gonna bring a lot more of that. Maybe you can all different kinds and then you can like break them. Ooh, you know? That would be really fun. Yeah. Um, I brought my own coffee maker, like an AeroPress, mm -hmm. but I actually didn't use it very much because I just had espresso. Mm -hmm. So I probably won't bring that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, oh, and less clothes. Mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna go like three outfits at most. Mm -hmm. So yeah. All right. Happy to see the science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll be cool to see it all come together. Yeah. 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 It's cool to, I think they like recently, so they went back in uh, January and like connected everything. So it was like a separate operation to like connect all the cables to the donut system. And so that's all starting to be streamed and they're like checking to make sure like all the data is like properly being like archived and stuff. So I think in the next like few months, there's going to be a lot more about like what they're able to see and if they're able to like in the next like year plus detect any sort of like solicitor kinds and stuff. Are any of the installations planned going to go through a split hole at all, do you know? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure like structurally. I think it's targeting, my sense is it's less like targeting specific fault zones and more like trying to just be in regions yeah. where like stuff like slow slip is happening. It'd be cool to have all of them operational so that you can see. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting too, because like they have a really good idea of what's happening in like a certain part, but then it's like, it's so local because yeah. you can only detect what's happening at that borehole. Mm -hmm. And so like expanding that to actually see if it's like a pervasive thing that you get slow slip out near the trench, because like before this work was done, like everyone was like, oh, well that like earthquakes don't happen in that part of the subduction zone it's like you have areas like maybe down dip that are like slow slip but they didn't even like know that this happened so it's like pretty cool 
Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there's like migration along. Yes, I yeah, cause I yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's like a connection between like there's also like the major events, like the magnitude eight events. It's like one happens and then a few years later the next happens, and it's like some sort of like something is controlling why you get like huge rupture like within a relatively close time period. And I wonder if there's something too where you can see some sort of connection in terms of like smaller seismic activity. Yeah, they're doing really cool. So Jamstack is like, <laughs> yeah. I think I would watch that birthday video every birthday for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah, it's so cute. And it's like the sound too, it's like do, 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 do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was impressed by like how they were able to do the entire thing. I had absolutely no idea, yeah. and it was like super elaborate. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, yeah, thanks for everybody.